Hello everyone. Uh, today I'm be having a conversation with Janice Parayat. She's an author of Seahorse, Sports on Land and um, Nine Chambered Heart. So I'm very excited to be talking to her and I hope all of you are as well. waiting for her to join us. Hi, Hi Janice. Hello, Hi. Hi, darling. Can so you nice to me? finally talk to you. Uh, can you please keep it louder? Yeah, you, let me just uh, figure this out a little bit. Can you hear yeah. me now? Yeah, yes, now? I can hear you now. Yes. Super. Okay, so lovely to see you. And yeah, I so lovely to this. see you. I'm a big fan of your work. I mean, I have read two of your books. Yeah. and you know really inspired i love your instagram post as well oh so, so, so nice. <laughs> thank you thank you for being here and thank you for being such a big supporter it's you know it's really heartening thank you yeah thanks janis for joining me uh, you know let's just get started with a little bit about you know when you decided to become a writer you know yeah. how how was your education your journey so far been like yeah um okay well to be very honest uh, i think my um my journey towards writing towards becoming a writer actually began um by me being a listener to many many stories um you know around me uh during my childhood in shillong in assam um i grew up in a community of storytellers so when people ask me you know who are your earliest literary influences i actually mm-hmm. tell them that my earliest literary influences never wrote a book a lot of them didn't know how to read or write but they told wonderful stories and i think that was so special about growing up in shillong growing up uh, you know in pockets of assam being surrounded by absolutely marvelous storytellers so i think before i was even a writer i loved to listen to stories um and i tried to tell stories um as well right and i think somehow then that transformed into the writing of stories and i have mm-hmm. to admit i'm one of those really annoying writers who will say i don't remember a time when i wasn't sort of writing mm. yeah so i would read a lot of enid blyton's you know i'm sure a lot of us grew up on enid blyton yes definitely so did i yes, exactly so i read a lot of her books and i stole all of her stories <laughs> and i stole all her characters and i just passed them off as my own so i was a huge plagiarist as a child <laughs> and my parents never you know discouraged me so i just thought wow this writing thing is very easy you know i just take all these characters all of these plots and i just you know make them my own um but that's really sort of you know the beginnings of you know storytelling uh for me yeah that's really interesting you know mm-hmm. uh, and i think from the northeast we have a lot of oral traditions as exactly. well so you know we hear from our grandmothers grandfathers you know yeah. uh, you know among cousins uh, and a lot of these things which has really i think influenced your writing especially uh, what i saw in both some men yeah. and i love how you drew on you know history the british you know when yeah. and especially because uh, we see meghalaya and shillong as you know the capital I mean the northeast capital for the british so yeah. it's really oh. interesting how you really drew on that and it's also your writing is very suffused with your memories of you know childhood there and especially the way you talk about the rain you know it's really it's beautiful i mean it conjures up this whole era and feels like you you know transformed there uh, you know so can you share any you know interesting uh, or you know funny memories of your childhood perhaps yeah, which, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, uh, um thank you first of all for all those lovely things that you have to say about the stories in Boats on Land and you're right they're very much deeply rooted in all the places that I I grew up um in you know especially Shillong uh Cherrapunji 
pockets of Assam because my father worked in the tea industry. So we were transferred all over um, Assam as well. Um, and, you know, my stories sort of really are very deeply grounded um, in all those places. To be honest, I think looking back now, um, in retrospect, of course, I see that, you know, my childhood, like a lot of us from the Northeast, mm -hmm. was actually marred by a lot of turbulence and, yeah. you know, curfews and sort of this very strong militarization of the region, mm -hmm. you know, that really distinctly stays with us a lot. Yeah. But as a child, I remember thinking, this is endless summer holidays. Like, I yeah. never have to go to school. I can just play on the streets with my friends. I don't have to do homework. It's great. You know, so I think there is a sense of the comic in all of this terrible, terrible sort of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, political turbulence that really, you know, sort of, um, um, sort of wave upon wave through most of the Northeast, you know, that that there was this other flip side to all of us growing up at that time thinking, wow, like I, I never have to do homework again. I can just stay home. Yeah. And I distinctly remember that because I was really young and I was too young to understand, you know, what it was all about. I, I really didn't. So, of course, now in retrospect, I realize, you know, how... Yeah sort of serious the situation was and how hard it was for our grandparents, our parents, um, you know, our older sort of family members. But um, yeah, for us, I just remember playing cricket or this game. I don't know if you played it as a child called Seven Stones, where you would pile up stones. Oh, and, yes, yes. Yes, yes. And then you would knock it down with the ball. Down, yeah. And yeah. one team had to rebuild that They did again, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, I remember that. Like, yeah, so there was this immense like childhood joy amidst all of this um, this turbulence, yeah. you know. I think you know I can relate a little bit uh, yeah. to how I think kids now during the lockdown. I mean, they must have also faced something similar, yes. you know. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. no school, you know, I mean, hardly any kind of learning. So. Yes, and, and the disruption of daily life, yeah. which to be very honest, as a child is hardly very interesting. You're mm -hmm. going to school, you're woken up really early, you have to yeah. slog through class, you have to come back for tuition, you have to do your homework. It's really boring. Yeah, but it's really like, tedious. Like, why would you yes, subject a child exactly, to that? Exactly. So, you know, pandemics, political turbulence to a child is just sort of holiday time. You yeah. Know? And I, I hope that um, some of the stories sort of in boats on land especially sort of mm -hmm. capture you know that kind of yeah. dual you know space yeah, yeah. It definitely did uh yeah. you know i also noticed that you promote a lot of you know literature and writers from the northeast and yeah. i remember one instagram post of yours where you had talked about how yeah. i think it was a list of curated list of you know writers from india and somehow it just left out you know writers from the Northeast or, you know, any book yeah. on the Northeast for that matter. So, yeah. uh, you know, can you yeah. recommend some writers or works to us, you know, so that we can read more? Because yeah. I feel it's really important to, you know, uh, of read this and be more inclusive in, you know, the kind of reading we do. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. And I, I feel like, you know, books should never just be on a list for the sake of tokenism. So you don't yeah. want to just have a book in there just because you have to tick off oh you've mm -hmm. covered this region or you've covered this you know this sort of geographical area and you've been inclusive but the truth is that there are incredible books um, incredible mm -hmm. stories that have come out of uh, the northeast and um, you know then you sort of sit and wonder well how is it that even these you know tremendous achievements have not sort of been you know, recognized in a list that claims to be, um, you know, inclusive and, uh, you know, celebrating Indian independence, you know, what, whatever that yeah. might mean to, to people from the Northeast. Um, but, 
you know, there are some books that come to mind. Uh, there's Mamang Dai's uh, um, Tales of Penzang, which Penzang, I, yes. I love. Yes, um, these series of interconnected short stories that she, mm -hmm. she writes. Mm -hmm. um, and they're so, so beautiful. There's a tremendous lot of poetry. Um, uh, and the anthology that I would hi highly recommend is Dancing Earth, which is which brings together poetry from all across uh, the Northeast mm -hmm. in so many different languages in translation. And it's been edited by two very fine poets, uh, Robin Ngangom and Ba mm -hmm. and Pam Singh uh, Nankanri. Mm -hmm. And it's called Dancing Earth. And it's this incredible anthology of, of poetry. Mm -hmm. Um, of course, there's Estherine Kire, who I, you know, I love so much. She's a wonderful person, wonderful writer. I would recommend any and all of her novels. Um, so, so yeah. good. Um, there's also Chetan Raj Shrestha from Sikkim, whose uh, book, actually, it's a little book of two novellas called The okay. King's Harvest. So good. Um, uh, you know, such fan two fantastic little novellas placed together. Um, there's a whole range of non-fiction uh, writing as well, uh, you know, on the Northeast um, by various scholars, not just from the region, but also from across the world. And I think I did a, a little Instagram post precisely yes, on, you know, sort of... Uh, um, um, on a, a Northeast reading list. So at least these sort of off the top of my head, otherwise I'll just keep going and we'll never see. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks so much. I mean, you know, I'll go back and I'll actually pick up Dancing Earth whenever possible. Yes, uh, you just wanted so to ask, good. what is it? Yes. Yeah. So you know, yeah. just wanted to ask what, you know, what does it take to be a writer is, you know, because it's something which we romanticize about, you know, we see, we think it's something fun and it's just based on, you know, bouts of inspiration and that, you know, so, or is it something which you have to sit down and, you know, is it, is it similar to like a nine to five where you have to, like, you know, sometimes the inspiration doesn't come. So yeah. how is it like, uh, you know, to be yeah. a writer, okay. to work on? Um, well, I think that actually you're right. People do have sort of this uh, slight miss uh, sort of uh, app, uh, comprehension that, um, you know, it's all about gazing out of windows and, you know, sitting with yeah. cups of tea and sort of taking long walks. Um, but sadly, writing is hardly as um, glamorous as, as all that. It is very much, as you said, uh, uh, an act of, discipline uh, so you are bringing yourself to your desk especially when you're working on a book when you're working on a story you are bringing yourself to the desk every day nine to five and for me that actually is my routine I wake up you know breakfast yoga whatever to the desk lunch to the desk tea to the desk and then you take you know a break at the end of the day so it's just the most sort of unglamorous um, sort of you know process um, possible but it's the only way to get the writing done um, you know word after word page after page um, and it, 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 it requires you to kind of work through as you said all the frustration that you might feel um, about not being able to you know put down what you think um, uh, you you should or you think would work um so there's you know there's a deep imbalance at least for me between the utter frustration of writing and the deep deep joy that you get from writing so a lot of the times i want to just hurl my manuscript out of the window and just be like why am i doing this you know this just why am i doing this to myself um, and then sort of coupled with the joy of looking at a sentence or a paragraph and saying, oh, that's actually working, you know, or that's, that's actually really um, reading nicely, um, you know, and you sort of give yourself a pat on the back. So it's really a mixture of so many things, a lot of frustration, a lot of joy, and a lot of discipline. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. Uh, you know, I just read uh, recently um, Nine Chambered Heart and, you know, I love how you bring a narrative of, you know, 
there are around uh, nine people who have loved or encountered a person yeah. through different times of her life and yeah. it's such a beautiful concept you know how did you come up with that i mean that's so and maybe i feel that maybe it might be slightly autobiographical also little bit yes yes yeah. yes um i think for me all my writing in some ways autobiography so it's always yeah. a part of me, always a part of my life um but some books more than others and definitely nine chambered heart is i think an exploration of you know a woman in some ways also getting to know herself you know so um it is told by different people uh, around her but mm-hmm. the center of the book is still her um, yeah. and the kind of uh, revelations or understandings that she comes to through her 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 life you know through her experiences um and i think um I think you know the idea for the book came to me when I was taking a walk with um you know someone who I loved very much and I thought would be in my life for a very very long time and we were going for a walk and by the end of that walk I realized that actually I think this is the end and in and it's not going to go any further than this and that we are not going to be together and i think a lot of us have had that experience of coming to realize that something will not be where you or will not go where you want it to go right um and mm-hmm. i started thinking about how for all of us if we place our relationships um you know sort of together one after another it becomes a biography told through love it becomes mm-hmm. the story of a life that is told through you know a uh, uh, one sort of relationship and then the next and then the next um and obviously in some ways following that character through her life right and that's how the idea for the book um uh, came to me um and that's why it's structured uh in yeah. you know in that way yeah it's it's really beautiful uh you know and Thank i love you. your short stories you know your instagram posts as well they're so beautiful and insightful and you know i do think social media has created a new space for you know writing and has created a new form of writing for that matter uh and you think yeah. is it um, has it democratized the space or has it also allowed a lot of uh not that good writing to be you know sort yeah. of promoted so yeah. what do you think about the role of social media and yeah. how it is played good okay right. this is actually something that i talk about with my students a lot because i teach a little bit of creative writing um okay. and we we do discuss how you know our consumption of stories has really expanded especially in the last sort of few years you know the way that we consume stories the way that we encounter stories fiction visual stories um has really drastically changed and i am actually really excited by it all i know that there are prophets of doom who say this is the end of books and this is the end of reading this is the end of everything and i actually don't really feel that way at all i feel that literature is something that's alive and takes many many forms that it doesn't exist only within the pages of a book it exists yeah. in the stories that we tell it exists in the stories that we look at um on our phones on instagram mm-hmm. on the stories that we we read in the captions of visuals that someone posts um on instagram i think that storytelling you know has to it has to so i think it has to be embracive of all of these different forms of storytelling that yeah. that are constantly going to 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 grow and develop you know i feel like if we think of if we think of the act of consuming stories as only one way to do it then we are mm-hmm. also relegating literature to the realm of the dead you know yeah. it is dead then if it's just going to be one thing in one way um and i think 
to go back to just what we said um, earlier, right at the beginning of this, I think because I grew up as a listener of stories, as so many of us did, mm-hmm. um, I think that I'm not really too partial to towards the you know the printed word. Mm-hmm. And I'm a writer saying that, and and you know, <laughs> it might seem so at odds with what I do and you know what I'm saying, but but I think that we have to be um, open to the fact that you know storytelling will just develop in directions that we cannot control and should not control. And you're right. Along with this kind of open space comes a lot of writing that perhaps well you know, um, I don't know, that perhaps people would deem not as, you know, well-written or not as literary as, Mm. sort of, you know, as, as other things. But that will also always be the case. You Mm. know, there's always been like rubbish writers and there's always been decent and, you know, sort of better writers. Yeah, Yeah. it just, just depends on how, we encounter them and now we encounter them perhaps a lot more easily Mm. um, than before. But yeah, no, I am all for, you know, an explosion of ways of storytelling. I think that we should be really excited rather than sort of feeling all sort of desolate about the death of the novel (laughs) and all of that, you know. Yeah. (laughs) Definitely. You know, I uh, just wanted to ask, you know, what is the practical aspect of, you know, becoming a writer? Like once you finish the book, you know, do you have yeah. an agent? You know, how do you send your script? Yeah. You know, do they get rejected? You know, how is yes. the process? Yeah. Okay. Um, that's a really good question. And it's a question that, you know, I sort of um, do get a lot because people, you know, are wondering how do you go about it? And it can seem really overwhelming and intimidating, um, you know, to a first time writer or someone who's mm-hmm. just starting out. Um, so my my advice would be um, to definitely, as you said, you know, have a, a, a manuscript that is mostly finished that you have a draft that is decent, that you're happy with. And um, this could be in terms of a novel or it could be in terms of, you know, a number of short stories that you've been working on that you'd like to, you know, bring into a collection. Um, And once you do that, once you have that, once you have that decent draft, um, then send it out, really. Um, You know, um, uh, there are so many sort of ways to access sort of publishing houses now. You just check their websites, check their Instagram accounts. I mean, you know, they're all over. Um, And a lot of the publishing houses, of course, are based in Delhi because it's sort of the the publishing, sort of traditional publishing capital of of the country. Um, And um, send out your manuscript to these publishing houses. And I know that it sounds like such a shot in the dark that, you know, who's going to receive this? Who's going to look at this? Who's going to even like open this envelope or check this email? But believe me, I I do have friends who are in publishing houses, who are editors, commissioning editors, and they read everything. Because they're, you know, the most exciting part of their job, I think, is finding new writers, is finding a voice that they want to champion. So even though it seems like such a, like I said, like such a shot in the dark, it's really important to send your work out, right? And and to, you know, either the bigger sort of publishing houses, Penguin, Random House, um, HarperCollins, Hachette, or the slightly smaller, um, more independent uh, publishing houses. Uh, There's Juggernaut, there's Aleph, there's um, Westland, um, right? Um, yeah. Now, as far as agents are concerned, I would imagine that agents are important. I think um, if you are looking uh, to, um, you know, sell rights for your books in the West, so abroad, mm-hmm. you know, the US or the UK, that kind of thing, Europe. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's not a bad idea to look for agents as well. There are quite a few agencies that have now come up in India. And it just, in some ways, you know, buffers the author from the act of like, you know, dealing with contracts and money and negotiating, which 
sometimes you know you Can might feel a little uncomfortable doing yes exactly mm-hmm. um so it's it you know i would say that now that agents are not that difficult to find um in you know in the country it might be a good idea to kind of get someone on your side to you know to negotiate all of these things um for you yeah i hope i hope that helps yeah yeah a little bit yeah but, yeah uh i've also noticed that you know you travel a lot is it you know is it for work or is it for pleasure yeah. or you know i've seen you go for workshops i think to south korea is writing workshops yes. so yes. you know so how is it like which is your favorite country you know favorite place to visit and uh has travel also affected your writing yeah uh, so oh that's such a good question and thank you for mm. asking that um i think that for me the act of traveling is a way of constantly having to readjust and to shift my perspective and to encounter the unfamiliar and f- sometimes even the unknown and i think that that keeps me um alive and it keeps me open to other ways of being in the world um i think that's what traveling you know um is so Im- it can be so important for mm-hmm. to realize that there are other people who live very differently from you um and who are in the world very differently from you and to to encounter that is such a gift you know it's such a blessing to be able to to see that and absorb it and in some way allow it to become part of of your life um as well in some way right so yeah. i think and I, i i would imagine that i speak um i i i speak for so many of us to say that right now we do miss um traveling, traveling so but it's also a point at which that you know at which we can think about how to travel in a more ethical in a more eco-friendly manner mm-hmm. right um mm-hmm. so that we burden the planet with our sort of weekend getaways and yeah. our sort of you know um um sort of winter breaks and summer breaks um and i think that actually for me writing and traveling have kind of gone hand in hand in some ways um simply because i think that writing also is about traveling mm. in so many ways it takes yeah. you on so many internal journeys um and it um you know opens you to to great vulnerabilities and to great unknowns even within yourself right um mm-hmm. and i think the two sort of go hand in hand and and so closely um and it's funny you should bring up sort of travel as well right now because the the book that i've been working on now for for so okay. many months years actually is actually a set of four travel logs four okay. travel logs yes so travel is so deeply embedded within the the plot within the you know the setting of uh, these intertwined um stories in my new novel so clearly you know it plays a huge huge um part in in my life <laughs> so excited for it to come out uh, you know you. it's coming out soon <laughs> uh you know are you friends with uh, other writers and you know how is it like to be you know friends yeah. with other writers because yeah. i've always romanticized the your idea of you know having a group of people who would you know be able to listen to you hear you out and you know sort of bounce ideas of each other so yeah. that's really fascinating oh that's oh that's such a sweet question yes i do have other writer friends and um you know we have sort of um i think well at least before the world sort of changed um in this rather unrecognizable way um i think it led to a great feeling of community um within a city um um especially like you know like delhi where i live where mm-hmm. you know it can be so sort of large and sprawling and it can just feel so anonymous um in ways but having that sense of okay there's not just me doing this there are other people doing this and yeah. other people who find meaning in writing the same way um 
that I do. And I think that, um, I think, you know, uh, I remember um, being told once that when people recognize you as a writer, that's when you feel most yourself. And I feel like that's what writers can do with each other. They can make them feel most themselves because they, you know, sort of accept and acknowledge and give importance to um, that act of writing that you spend so many long, lonely hours, um, you know, doing. Um, it's, it's, I think the other thing, thing that's really been um, great about having writer friends, sort of meeting them at, at Lit Fest or little literary events and all of that, and talking about writing, is that you realize there are so many kinds of writers in mm -hmm. the sense that everyone's process is so different. You know, that you might be a certain kind of writer who does things in this way, and somebody else might be the absolute opposite of you. And it helps you realize that there are so many textures to the act of writing that, you know, there's no one right way to do it. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's wonderful that, that there is this kind of multi multiplicity, you know, and each of them being engaged in their own sort of areas of interest in, in some ways, right? It just makes yeah. you kind of realize how mind bogglingly, Large, diverse. Yeah. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. You know, just one last question is, you know, what what is your advice or tips to aspiring writers? You know, how should they get started? Yeah. Okay. Um. You know, someone once told me that no one else can tell your story, and I thought that that was the thing that I needed to hold so close to my heart because it's true. Um, you know, no one has had the exact same experiences as you in the exact same chronological order, in the exact same geographical spaces with, you know, exactly the same people around you. Um, and that makes you so infinitely, um, you know, singular and unique. And that is what gives power to, you know, the stories that you carry. Um, that no one else can tell them the same way that you would choose to tell them. And, and I think that, that gives me a great sense of, um, um, a great sense of, um, what, what is the word? Power? No, I don't know if it's power. the way that, oh, I am sort of, you know, so yeah. unique and so special. But I think that once you feel that you're worth, it makes your story, it makes you feel that your story is worth telling. Mm -hmm. and I think that's always a good place to start because the act of writing it itself will take time. And, you know, you only become a better writer as you keep writing. But to believe that your story is worth telling because it is, yours and only yours is a very very good place to start thank you so much Janice for you know coming as my guest and so happy that you could find time and you know so excited for your new books and so thank you so much for joining in thank you Pooja you've asked such wonderful questions and you've been such a wonderful supporter as I said so thank you so much for, for this, really. And have a lovely Sunday. And to everyone who's joined us here, you know, thank you so much for being here and taking some time out of your Sunday lunch um, to join us. Yeah. Um, yeah. Have a take great care day. And yeah. Stay safe. Yeah. Bye, you Puja. Too. Bye, bye. Take care. Bye. bye.